This program contains scenes that have been dramatized, with special attention given to historical accuracy. When the Soviet Union invades Afghanistan, they go deep into the shadows to fight back. The U.S. government's initial reaction was, was very swift. We were going to give it everything we had, one last push. A huge covert action program to help drive the Soviets out. While future enemies lurk nearby, these undercover shadow warriors will take on a communist superpower on one of history's harshest battlefields. We have an opportunity to really punish the Soviets. They have made a rare mistake, and a mistake of large proportions. Go win this thing. December 24, 1979. When Soviet troops invade Afghanistan, the Cold War suddenly becomes hot. Caught by surprise, U.S. officials worry the Soviets will continue their march into the territory of American allies. The Central Intelligence Agency is immediately directed to begin a covert action program to beat back the communists. Jimmy Carter issued a secret presidential finding shortly after the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. And he directed the CIA to go ahead and use all means to help the Afghans resist this. We're basically facing a, a country with nuclear weapon that could uh, destroy the United States a thousand times over. And that country was very unstable. Milt Bearden, a career undercover operative, is head of the CIA cell in Pakistan. Here, Bearden and his team will launch a campaign to drive the Soviets out of Afghanistan and end the Cold War once and for all. A legendary figure among his colleagues, Bearden is ideally suited for the job. He's a charismatic, larger-than-life figure who loved to operate, loved to be out in the field, liked to really push the envelope of what he was doing. Milt at the time was greater than life. Nobody comes close. Bearden's team will work secretly out of the American embassy in Islamabad, Pakistan. The CIA station is a hand-picked group of some of the best officers in American intelligence. I kept it small. You don't want something big. The Pentagon always wanted to run this thing. And they were thinking in terms of about a battalion of Americans. That's like 500 people. I tried to do it with a handful. Another CIA intelligence cell will join Bearden's team. Their leader is Gary Schroen, a CIA officer with years of experience in the Middle East. He is a, a truly remarkable American, and I think uh, someone who has on many more than one occasion risked his life to further American interests. CIA officers are a special breed, able to disappear quickly, assume a disguise, and gain the trust of those they recruit to spy for them. You look for people who can get around the diplomatic circuit, can uh, mix it up with foreign diplomats uh, on a social basis, establish contacts, develop friendships, and, and those kinds of things that allow them to have access to people that, that they really want to eventually recruit. You can't really trust anybody. And even your close friends who are outside the agency, you can't really tell them what you do. Working cover jobs by day, the CIA officers wait to do their real work under the cover of darkness. Usually, a case officer would meet his agent at night, uh, after hours, because you'd be less prying eyes. Summer 1985. Bearden and his team methodically gather intelligence about the Soviets' weaknesses inside Afghanistan, where several tribal groups of Afghans, known as the Mujahideen, resist the invasion. 
Rugged but disorganized, the Mujahideen are fighting for their homeland. A couple hundred thousand full and part-time fighters. They had their own rhythm of war, and uh, we had to learn to, to adapt to that. Uh, as a fighter, he does it his way, not ours. And Mujahideen, they were ready to fight in all sides, in all uh, ways. Every single Afghan wanted to, to fight the Soviets and kill the Soviets, the invaders. With the Mujahideen, America sees an opportunity to push back the Russians and perhaps cripple the Soviet Union once and for all. We have an opportunity here to really punish the Soviets. They have made a rare mistake and a mistake of large proportions. And we ought to rush in to Afghanistan and make sure that they pay as high a price as possible for this error. The CIA officers must be careful to operate under deep secrecy and not alert the Russian intelligence service, the KGB, of their intentions to support the Afghan resistance. The Russian KGB was very aggressive at watching our officers and all the American embassy officers arresting any Afghans who, who happened to be seen with uh, dealing with Americans. January 1980, as Russian troops expand their movement into Afghanistan, the CIA sends the first shipments of weapons and supplies to the Mujahideen. The assistance does little to repel the Soviets. These were initially very light weapons chosen so that it wouldn't be apparent to anyone that the CIA had paid for them. The first guns they purchased were old Lee Enfield colonial rifles, a single shot rifles really of 60 years or more vintage. Uh, Mauser rifles and things left over from you know, World War II, if not earlier. The weapons and ammunition provided by the CIA travel a long, arduous route into Afghanistan. Some of it would be ships on the high sea or C-5As bringing stuff in. Then they're broken down, and you'll see the small Toyota pickup trucks. And we probably had the largest Toyota dealership in, in Southeast Asia at that time. But then ultimately, onto the backs of a mule. You have to go over those uh, god-awful, rugged hills of Afghanistan, and you need mules. So I bought all the mules that could be made in China, mules that were made in parts of Africa, the mules are perfect for transporting heavy loads of guns and ammo through the mountainous battle zones of Afghanistan. In addition to military ordnance, the CIA also begins to send in shipments of money to the Mujahideen commanders. We want to support the commanders who did most of the fightings. We supported them on a monthly basis, so we had a certain amount of money per month. Whatever I had uh, could have had me killed uh, very easily. Some of them I paid a good deal of money to, to make sure that they would feel it's in their interest to tell me the truth. The money was meant to put an army in the field, to pay for food and weaponry, ammunition, to pay off villagers, to pay bribes. But the money and outdated weapons are no match for the Soviet army, which soon controls much of the country. The Soviet soldiers develop a reputation for brutality and begin to launch targeted assassinations of resistance commanders at refugee camps inside Pakistan. There were a number of assassinations inside uh, Pakistan in these refugee camps where the Afghan communists were reaching out to, to get and, and kill Mujahideen figures, political figures, or, or people in the refugee camps who they considered to be a threat. But the Mujahideen refused to be eradicated. The Russians are attempting to occupy a country that has never suffered under foreign rule for long. The Russian soldiers soon learn this. It was a brutal war in uh, just about every respect. In their memoirs and in the stories they've told as veterans, there's a sense uh, familiar from the experiences of other armies of occupation of just pervasive fear, suspicion, and an attitude of, we had better shoot first, because the alternative is that they'll get us. And so this contributed to a culture of brutality among the Soviet forces 
that was exacerbated by a breakdown in discipline on the front lines. As the vicious war slogs on, the Mujahideen are getting low on weapons. The CIA has more advanced weaponry available, but is wary of tipping their hand to Moscow. If the Soviets learn of America's secret involvement in Afghanistan, it could escalate into nuclear war. The CIA faced a turning point, and the question was, are we now prepared to supply weapons that it will be obvious came from us? Kabul, 1986. The Soviet Union rules Afghanistan through fear and brutality. The Afghan resistance fighters known as the Mujahideen are losing the war. Struggling to turn the tide, the CIA must decide which is riskier, provoking the nuclear-armed Soviets or conceding defeat. President Reagan had decided that this was turning into some sort of a stalemate where the Afghans couldn't win. They would just continue to bleed the Soviets, but in the process of bleeding the Soviets, they had already given up a million dead Afghans, a million and a half wounded, and five million had been driven into exile. There was a decision, collective decision made in Washington at the policy level that we wanted to really ratchet up the effort. So we enlarged the staff both in Washington and in the field. Spring 1986, CIA officer Milt Bearden meets with agency director William Casey and learns of a new covert task force that will expand America's support for the Mujahideen. The head of the Afghan task force was a man named Jack Devine, who was very cautious. And Jack was probably the perfect guy to run the task force from Washington because he understood uh, the political dynamics. There was an effort to make known to them that we were, we were really pushing hard and that they were going to have difficulty. So Bill Casey's uh, instructions to me were, let's try to go win it, actually win it. I think he had a plan in his own head uh, that involved a variety of, of hot buttons that he would be using to keep forcing the Soviet Union into a deeper, deeper pit. Try to come up with ways that you can make every day a terrible day for the Soviets to, to torment to them to where, as their leaders began to discuss with our leaders uh, the prospect of ending this war and reaching an agreement. To better fight such a ruthless enemy, the CIA first teaches the Mujahideen how to sabotage the Soviets. Well, one of the other aspects of this whole overall program was to try to cripple the Russian equipment. Remote-controlled bombs, uh, time devices, and occasionally even car bombs and briefcase bombs to try to assassinate the Soviet leadership inside the capital of Kabul. So there were a lot of these kind of sabotage, quick hit and run raids. Things like dams, power pylons, power lines, power generation plants, uh, uh, infrastructure targets, bridges, that kind of thing. One of the CIA tools of sabotage is a special timer used to set off bombs. The CIA supplied a device that was commonly called a pencil timer, which was simply a chemical delay timer that could be installed in an explosive device by a gorilla who would leave the device and then retreat and the chemical burn would be predictable to a certain time and then whether it was a half an hour or six hours later the device would explode. As huge shipments of American aid flows to the Mujahideen, Bearden's team struggles to get good information about the impact the money and weapons are making on the actual battlefield. Until the CIA began to recruit its own agents in the late 80s, it had to rely almost entirely on Pakistani intelligence for reports about how the war was going. To reduce visibility, the CIA has been directing the Afghan resistance through Pakistan's intelligence service. Now, Bearden decides to directly recruit new spies from among the Mujahideen commanders. 
The Americans were cultivating sources of their own. CIA was spending a lot of money. And subsequently, they got directly in touch with many of the commanders 